Hey everyone, we are kicking off a new month and we want to announce the winner for last month. The winner for August is Superfan Ernie. Congratulations, Ernie. You will get to choose one of our films for next year. Remember, if you want to participate in this contest, simply email your guest to Christy at dodgemediaproductions.com. Check out the show notes for this exact email and a link where you can submit your guests. Throughout the month, you may guess the theme as many times as you want, and winners receive a shout out in the episode, a shout out on our social media, your name posted on the website with the number of times you've won. At the end of the year, we will throw everyone who guessed into a hopper and pick one, and one person will win a $100 Amazon gift card. So congratulations, Ernie. You have a chance at winning that gift card. Be thinking of your movie. You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts. So this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 133. And before we start talking about the 1999 office space film. I would like to let everybody know that we are starting to plan for 2020. And that means that this is your window to make suggestions about things you like that we do. You can tell us things you don't like. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing it, but I might. (laughs) I probably won't, but you know. (laughs) But this is your chance. We're open for suggestions. And so you can suggest movies. You can suggest themes. You can suggest don't ever do a contest again. I will take that one because I'm not going to. (laughs) More cowbell? (laughs) Yeah, sure. More cowbell, you say? Awesome. It sounds like the luge at the Winter Olympics. <laughs> yeah, it does. So write me at christy at dodgemediaproductions.com or you can go on any of our uh, social media pages, Facebook, Instagram uh, for Dodge Media Productions and let me know. I'm open. I'm all ears. See, let's talk about this Mike Judge film. He directed this film and Beavis and Butthead, King of the Hill and Silicon Valley. He also wrote this. It stars... It stars Ron Livingston, Jennifer Aniston, David Herman, Jay Nadu, Dietrich Bader, Stephen Root, Gary Cole, and Richard Real. The DP for this film is Tim Sturdit, who also who did one of my faves in 1988, Mystic Pizza, Ooh. our formerly discussed 89, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Excellent. As, as well as the 2006 Idiocracy. Right. So he worked with Judge. Wasn't Idiocracy also a Judge joint? It is. This is a 20th Century Fox film. And the synopsis for this film is three company workers who hate their job decide to rebel against their greedy boss. I wouldn't say greedy. He's just a jerk. Well, I, I mean, I guess I don't greedy because he doesn't pay them well and wants them to work over. But Right. And, and it benefits him. I think they establish in dialogue, Peter establishes that Lumber gets a big bonus and they get nothing. Oh, OK. Tagline? Work sucks. Everybody's going to agree with that. Don't know if it tells us a lot about the film, but OK. But I think in the vein of the film, just like, let's let's not be cute. Sure. Let's just yeah, get down yeah. to brass tacks and chase. it works. I like it. Yeah. Okay. What is the pickup line for this film? Okay. Michael Bolton is singing along to a rap song and it's, I got my pistol pawn cocked. I had to look up the lyrics to the song because it makes no sense. Pistol. We know pistol pawn as in pawn shop or the piece in chess cocked. I don't know what that those three words together mean but that's what it is okay for the cinematography for this film now it was Stephen root was on rich eisen's show and he said because rich asked him did you guys know you're making like this cult classic and which is a silly question because i don't think Very. anybody knows nope that it's something's going to be a cult classic it's like going viral you can't predict that and steven said no we just all thought we were making like a, a nice little b movie Right. And so to me, it does have kind of that indie, I wouldn't say B movie, but like an indie vibe to it. Totally. But it kind of works because it's not, 
to, if you did this film with a, a high def camera and like, you know, like it was sparkly and shiny and well lit. Right. Like I'm thinking like, um, the, this social, whatever the Fincher film about network. Facebook, the yeah. social network. Yeah. Yeah. If you, but that even seems dark. What I'm saying is this film kind of needs to have some grain because you right. don't want it to look polished because right. their right. life is not polished. And especially when they're in the offices of Inatech, you want the lighting to be horrible because fluorescent lighting is, by its very definition, horrible. Right. A la um, Joe versus the Volcano, right? That horrible yeah, lighting pretty much. sucking the right. life out of you. Yep. So I felt like the cinematography worked. Mm-hmm. And, it, and like even Livingston's apartment looks like they just rented, you know, kind of like a, a hotel room or a, a tiny little apartment. But it works because... They, they're making just enough to have a decent apartment, but not that much more that he has like really nice furniture or... Right. One thing that maybe is a little bit more indie, but more maybe even student filmy, they did oh, one thing a couple of times, and I made a note of the first time, when Peter is coming to work and he gets shocked by the door handle, when he goes to reach out, they cut to a shot of his hand reaching in and it's dirty with the door handle. The, how do they get the camera there? So they had to basically take that door handle or a matching one, and some PA is holding it, right? And, and so that to me is, so maybe you'd say that's not indie because they had the extra production of taking the door handle out and holding it, but then that feels to me very much like somebody who doesn't have a lot of resources, so they're trying to make the film visually interesting. And that's the thing that they could do. Whereas maybe if you had a ton of money, you'd be then like, okay, so we're going to have a crane shot and then we'll digitally morph it into the steady cam and have them walking through the, the hallway. We'll do a walk and talk. And then we'll, and they're like, no, we can't afford that. So they were doing something different. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, this was filmed in Austin, Texas. I don't know if they ever say where this is supposed to be, but you definitely get the heat. Like, I just feel like you can feel how hot this place is and that it's just in this industrial park. Yeah, it's pretty miserable. If I remember correctly from the trivia, from one of the, I think the location they use for the tchotchkes, which isn't a real restaurant, I don't think, it's in this tech, like, park. And It is. um, Where the restaurants are apparently in this cluster in the middle and so all of these drones from Inatech and Inatrode and Inna whatever, <laughs> I'll go to there for lunch. And I was like, oh, okay. I totally remember places like that in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it captured that well. Yeah, very much so. So the classic, I mean, if you haven't seen this movie, what rock are you living under? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we've got the classic TPS report that two different bosses come by and ask Peter for. And even though he says, yep, got it. I'm going to do it. They, they keep almost like your mom. They keep scolding on you it. and harping yeah. on you. Like you have They're to get brow this. beating him. Yeah. And I think that all by itself. Yeah. The TPS thing describes what it's like to work in corporate America, which is why I am stunned that more people don't burn the building down. (laughs) They don't do what Milton Milton did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then the smarmy lady who comes by. Somebody's having a case of the Mondays. So yes, you've also encountered that person and you're not allowed to punch them as much as they deserve it. I have to say, I felt bad that I had picked this because this, when this movie came out, oh, I guess we hadn't met yet. Oh no, we had probably met, but weren't married. 93. Sure. So, because I remember watching this movie with you back then and you loved this movie because yes. I think you so resonated with it. Oh. It, so now 30 years later though, unfortunately, this movie kind of bummed you out right after we watched it. Yeah. It's really depressing because it's so accurate. What a waste of a life. To work in that environment, it's useless. Yeah, well, I mean, it afforded us a good life. I suppose, but it, but it your, shows your how... poor soul. Yeah, well, yeah, it's de- by the, almost a definition of soul crushing. Right. Yeah, and then they show the, the, the actor, I think his name is Tom, played by Richard Reel with a 
the jump to conclusions Mac guy, and he's paranoid about getting laid off again. Mm. Uh, very accurate. <laughs> very accurate. Yeah. I know when he said that, I was like, oh my God, I think I've heard Mike say that exactly. Oh yeah, this is, I it mean, was, it was a little, it was a little too close to home. Yeah. You could tell the judge had worked in, in the yeah. environment cause he got it perfect. He said that he worked with a guy who was always complaining about if they move my desk one more time, I'm going to quit. Right. And it's funny cause you work with somebody right now that kind of has that same kind of energy. <laughs> like if they do this one more time. Right. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Milton because the reason or not the one of the reasons why I lost my mind when I saw this film is I worked with a guy who I was told I could listen to my radio at a reasonable volume. So uh, I'm just going to name names. Irving Biner, love you, buddy, but I hated this damn radio. <laughs> he had the radio. This was before iPods and all of that, but we still had earbuds. Yeah. They were wired. Yeah. And he refused to plug them in. He would listen to it. And they would tell him it has to be at a low volume. And somehow it kept getting louder and louder all day long until the whole flipping office was listening to his stupid, like whatever he was listening to, talk radio. And then somebody would tell him, you got to turn it down. I was like, oh my gosh. When I saw that Milton, I'm like, I worked with that guy. Yeah. All right. So brief digression. Irv had a couple fun things though. Again, I'm going to hand You're out the credit. Tell a couple good stories. Right. So Irving was a Jewish guy. Irving Biner, maybe he didn't know from the name, uh, lived in L.A. at a tabernacle that, as you may recall, in Jewish culture, a bar mitzvah is a big deal, and they go all out. And so he was talking about how for someone's bar mitzvah, they had hired this local Jewish comedian, and he, he was on television. He had a TV show now. And so they went to see the TV show. And he described this character and his dumb buddy got lost in a parking structure. And he was really amazed that they could bring cars onto the set. And he's described this. That was Jerry Seinfeld. His tabernacle hired Jerry Seinfeld for the, somebody's bar mitzvah. That's amazing. Which is amazing. But probably my favorite Irving Biner story. Uh, the last person to the staff meeting every week had to bring pastries. He brought bagels. We're sitting there and I say, bagels are proof that the Jews are God-chosen people. And without missing a beat, Irv says, and gefilte fish is proof we're not. <laughs> so he had a great sense of humor. It was just that damn radio. Yeah. Was he listening to Jerry Seinfeld on the radio? No, because I wouldn't have minded that. <laughs> that would have been hilarious. Can you imagine that? Eight hours a day of Seinfeld stand-up? I think that was a great way to set a tone in a workplace. Right. I bet you can attribute or can relate to the daily stand-ups when they would have that in the movie. Oh. Everybody just looked so bored out of their mind. Right. And and as I was telling someone else recently, the thing with the cake, that happened to me all the time. I did not get a piece of cake. You didn't get a piece of cake? Of all people in the office, I, I love cake. Right. It's my jam. Yeah. Yeah. And so when they had that scene, I was like, yeah, I've been that guy. You, you were poor Milton. I, I have had some Milton moments. That is true. <laughs> um, I thought it was mean. I forgot this part. Gary Cole's character... Just to tweak Milton, because I was like, is, all the times I've ever watched this, is Gary Cole just unaware? Oh, no. Is Well, and I shouldn't say Gary Cole. Let me see. Lumberg. Lumberg. Bill Lumberg. Is he unaware that he's being a jerk? Nope. Nope. And when he steals Milton's red line, I'm like, oh, no, he's doing this to make him crazy. And the moving the cubicle thing. Yeah. I've also worked with people like that right. at that level. Right. So, again... It is a testament to human beings that they haven't shot and killed more vice presidents, it, given it that is. kind of behavior. It really is. Yeah. People are kind. Yeah. Some yeah, of them. Yeah, very nice. I loved the opening scene because, you know, we talk about this a lot, like kind of introducing us. And so we see Ron Livingston in, his, or I should say, we Peter see Gibbons. Peter Gibbons in his car and it's just the start and stop and it, it's very jerky and it shows his feet on the pedals so that gets us if we didn't already notice the the thing starting and you know the car starting right. and stopping we see that his feet and and then he changes into the other lane because it's going faster and then the lane he was in starts going faster and so he changes back and then you know it's just 
it's horrible. And it just got me into that place. Like, this is why I don't go on the 217 because yeah. it, it makes me crazy to sit in traffic. Yeah. So everybody who hates traffic, next time you see a politician, kick them in the nuts because they're, <laughs> they're the reason for it. But yeah, and the commute traffic. Imagine starting your day at Inatech with that commute. Right. And then uh, we see Stephen Root. He's at the bus stop, which he's, I mean, worse than traffic is happening to ride. Yeah, mass, mass transit. transit. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then Gary Cole just drives in in his Porsche, parks in the front row, and and goes in. And you see Peter Gibbons. <laughs> I thought it was funny because these big parks, they sometimes try to put green spaces in them, but it was this big divot, like this big right. dip. And so you're parked so far out that you, and you could walk around the cement, I'm sure, but it's just so hot. You right. want to get inside the building as fast as possible. So you walk down into this kind of like almost like a gully or something. I don't know what you call it. And then back up. And then to make things worse, you're not even at your desk. And you mentioned this previous, you go to open the front door. Yeah. And you can tell he's been zapped by this static electricity so many times. Right. That he's trying to like punch it almost to try to just reduce. Sure. Yeah. This charge. And then it gets him anyway. Yeah. So the, the dip, I would call that a moat. And I believe they put it. those in place to make it harder for disgruntled employees to drive truck bombs into the building. I also appreciated in that opening scene, they did it as he walks into his cubicle, we're now overhead almost, you know. Yeah, that was great filmmaking because the show don't tell. He could have dialogue and say, my cubicle's so small that I blah, blah, blah. Not as good as showing it from above. That was a good yeah. good, good choice. That was, I liked that. The other editing thing I liked that we mentioned, which isn't practical, but it worked. Like it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but it worked. Michael Bolton is getting ready to launch the bug that is going to make them millions. And for a split second, his desk basically becomes glass. And yeah. we see the bottom of the mouse and we're, we're basically under the audience is under his desk looking up at him pressing the button. And so through the desk and then it actually cuts too. Cause I was like, Oh, did he have a glass desk? No cuts to now above the desk and it's a regular solid mm -hmm. desk and his mouse is there. So that was a cool shot and they got away with it. I think because it was a cool shot because it didn't make any sense why we would. Right. How would we possibly see the mouse? Also the computer that Peter uses appears to be some weird hybrid of a Mac and a PC, which Judge would know better. I think he just put it in to, to show the nonsense. But yeah, that was another case like with the doorknob where I thought they did some clever stuff with cinematography, which to me felt like we don't have money to burn on a steady cam or a giant crane. So we're going to try to do some things practically to make the film a bit more interesting. Yeah, let's get creative. Yeah. Do you know Mike Judge's history? Because if he worked in these office buildings, so he probably didn't go to film school, yeah? And I, as far as I know, I don't know. So but... maybe just hitching his wagon to that DP, Tim... Well, Started. if you look at Beavis and Butthead, right, that's not necessarily it's pretty particularly... primitive. Yeah, it's pretty primitive, so... Yeah. And he may just have like a dumb buddy that drew that for him. I don't know. So I kind of raced through my cinematography writing editing. Is there anything that you have that you want to bring up before we move on to our other? Well, for topics? cinematography, I did make note. We had two different montages. We had the Peter Gibbons taking back his life after he's been hypnotized montage. And then what I called the Ocean's Eleven montage as they're attempting to rip off a thing. You missed one. The bashing the printer min montage. Oh, is that a... Okay, uh, yeah. Well, maybe... Uh, it's, yeah, it's totally a montage. Okay, yeah, that's, a, again, a third one then. In the, fact, the printing. Ron Livingston said that as a PR for the film, they, in like Boston or something, in a like a square, brought out a printer, let people bash it, get their... And he said it got a little rough. It almost yeah. turned into like a riot. Because people just were going at this piece of machinery with all of their 
work anger. So during finals week at Harvey Mudd, there um, were quiet hours. You had to be completely quiet during a certain period of time to let people study. And that, of course, built up some desire to be loud. So they had something called noisy minutes. I think it was 15 minutes. In the middle of quiet hours, you get noisy minutes. And it was game on. So at West Storm, which was the metal dorm, they would buy a car from the junkyard that didn't run and have it towed. One car? When you say metal dorm, are you saying like... Heavy metal. Okay, thank you. It was made out of cinder block, but that's where all the metal heads lived, including Richie Strong, who bought the speakers from the student body for parties just for his own room. So he's probably deaf by now. Anyway, uh, Uh, very good. Almost got me. So um, they would drag this this derelict car in there, and then for noisy minutes, I think they may have even done this as a fundraiser, but maybe not. You could take a bat or a sledgehammer and go crazy on this car, uh, like with the printer, but the car, it was bigger, so more people could participate. And then at the end of finals week, they paid to have it towed back to the junkyard. It's almost like they were the predecessors of these, like, Places you can go to get your anger yes, out. Yes, right. Have those the- rooms exactly is maybe it was a former West Dormer. Now that I think, <laughs> I think about it, right. I think Mike Parrott is probably the guy behind that theory. <laughs> I, I, I think I know the guy. All right. Um, well, oh, so is there anything else? So as far as sets go, I, I will mention I've heard a couple of different things about this red swing line. For years, I'd heard they didn't exist, and then uh, the trivia for IMDb, which is notoriously not fact checked. I have the facts. Uh, they said that they did make them, had stopped making them, and resumed. I don't know about that. It's, um, it's kind of right. So Stephen Root on the Rich Eisen show mm. said, Mike Judge approached Swingline and said, will you please make me f- four red ones for the, the film? And they were like, no, we don't We do not do that. Nobody, nobody would buy a red one. They want things right. to blend in, so they would want black and gray. And so the props department made four red swing lines, right. took the swing lines, painted them. And then, yeah. and then this is what I love. Like then they had to re-add that back is my the favorite part. White swing line. I want to talk In to that. Cursive. Props person. Yes. Yeah. So there were four. One was burnt up for the fire. Yeah. One Mike Judge took. Nice. And one Stephen Root has. Okay. So there's one still there's remaining. one at large. Right. Well, I have... A red swing uh, line. Yeah. And then then people co- kept contacting swing line for the red ones. And they were like, look, we don't make them. People started painting them themselves and selling them on eBay and making tons of money on them. With a crappy product. Right. And so swing line was like, okay. And then they started making yeah. them. Yeah. So I've had one uh, for years. Mm-hmm. And back when I had like an office, I would put it on my desk and it was a huge fan or a huge draw. People yeah. loved, people love the red Who swing Who doesn't line. love it? It's an iconic piece of. Right. Like, I hope, I hope the fourth one's in the Smithsonian. Like, that's really where it should be in that, you know, they have that TV yeah, and totally. film. Yeah, Right. That's where that fourth one needs so, to be. There's a, in the conference room where the Bobs interview people for their job, mm-hmm. there's a picture on the wall behind the person being interviewed. And it's like a, a, a picture of an exterior of a building, which again, I'm not sure why you would need a picture of your own building in your building, but mm-hmm. there you go. What's eerie about that is... Uh, that's a place I think I worked 2000. You, you, you really <laughs> couldn't tell the difference in that photo. Right, right. But the bobs are great too. They are. Because I think the bobs capture, again, the people that come in and lay people off, right? And so there's this great uh, you know, thing where the Richard Real character is yelling, I have people skills. But then I think this is not just comic. I do actually think this could happen. When Peter basically no longer cares that they're like, oh, he's got management material. See, he's bored with your stupid. And so he says, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that I don't care. One of your favorite lines. Oh, there's so many in this film. Pete. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And then Peter, you've been missing a lot of work lately. I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. (laughs) Uh, And that's so great because inside certain eras, right, generations in the software industry, you can just say, I wouldn't say I've been missing it, and everybody knows what you're what you're talking about. So there's also, what would you say you do here? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's great, and, and I love that. 
I don't like my job and I don't think I'm going to go anymore. <laughs> oh, man, who has not had that, that feeling, right? So, yeah, th- this, is, th- th- this film entirely captures what I hope is a narrow window in history where this kind of torture was considered reasonable. Yeah, was it in the film? I think Peter says humans were not meant to live in cubicles and stare at computers all day. Right. I, I uh, not not to make fun of people who were POWs in in World War II, but to me this is like Hogan's Heroes, but for office space, it's making fun of what is really quite a miserable existence. And so we have all these funny characters, but underneath it all, there is this like authenticity where Judge kind of just hits the right perfect note for people, of course, who, who've been through that, right? And that might be a fairly narrow niche. I don't know. Uh, maybe not everyone resonates with that because we were talking about this recently in a situation and somebody said to you, oh, well, it's just like, you know, every normal corporate annual performance review. And you were delightfully able to say, I don't know. I've never done one of those. <laughs> ah, so jealous. <laughs> so maybe there are people out there who are like, ah, it's a funny movie, but I don't quite get it. Yeah. But there's, I think, a whole segment of people, even if you don't work in software, I think anybody that works in a cubicle gets right. that film. But in a way, that's the brilliance of Mike Judge in this film, because not maybe not everybody worked in a cubicle, but then he puts in Jennifer Aniston's character, who's basically dealing with the same soul sucking, (laughs) you know, kind of in a, in a service industry where her boss is kind of doing similar oppressive kind of things to her. And so I believe that that's why this film is so well loved because either you're in an office or you're in a service industry and or anybody has had I was trying to think really quick. I don't think I've had a douchey boss, but many people have had douchey bosses. And and so I think that's why this film is right. so beloved. And then there's the Orlando Jones character, the guy yes. who's selling magazines. Yes. And how he can make more money selling magazines, <laughs> pretending to be a disadvantaged young black man yeah. than he can at his other job. Oh, geez. Yeah, it's just, it really is priceless. Yeah. And I suspect after the last three years, there are people who find this even more poignant, given how little they're probably making to go to some stupid job in a cubicle. And then, you know, through no choice of their own, they're suddenly like Peter where they're outside shoveling up wreckage of something with, with a, a, a square shovel and they realize, well, this isn't so bad after all. <laughs> right. And his friends come by and they're like, hey, we can get you a job at wherever they're now In working. Trode, awesome name. And, he, and he's like, no, I'm good. So even, yeah. So what is the measure of, of how you want to spend the time that you have to spend to make money right. so that you can live? So... Peter says, line of dialogue. So I was sitting in my cubicle today and I realized ever since I started working, every single day of my life has been worse than the day before it. Mm. Ouch. And I, I, I don't think most people could say every day is worse than the day before it. But I think if I'm running a business and my employees have that feeling, I, I feel like I'm failing. Totally. Right? Totally. Yeah. Um, but I don't think Lumberg cares. Nope. Nope. So was there any head trauma in this film? No head trauma that I noticed, although there should have been. I'm telling you, Lumberg really deserves it. Yes. How about a smooch? Smoochy, smoochy, smoochy. So I didn't make a note of a smoochy between Jennifer Aniston and Ron Livingston. But she stays over, so we know that they're intimate. There's an implication, but I didn't make a note of an on-screen smooch. I can't believe that they know They most ac- mostly actually fight <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, but not at first. I'm sure, I'm sure there is one. I just didn't notice it. Okay. And how about a driving one? Okay. So this is uh, one of the things we talked about with Superfan Lisa is the use of cars to talk about the characters, much like costuming and sets. Right, so Peter's tan 96 Toyota Corolla says, bland, boring, I'm killing time till death. Right, it's a perfect car. Sorry, Toyota, but at that era, your cars were not very sexy. Well, the the lower end models. 
Um, Michael Bolton instead drives this 97 Pontiac Grand Prix, which is very much a Midwest old man car, which is to set up how it's hilarious that he's listening to gangster rap. Right? It's just part of the joke. Right. And then Samir drives an 87 Pontiac Firebird Formula, which shows he really, really wants to pick up chicks. And as we have determined empirically, hot rods are not as effective as one might think at that. Lumberg drives an 82 Porsche 911. So at the time this film was made, that car is, what, 17 years old? It's pretty, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly old. So that part, I mean, I don't know if the average person would have clocked the year, but the Porsche with the big tires shows that he's like doing very, very well financially, right? He makes much more money and he can park right up front. He doesn't have to park across the moat in the, in the overflow lot. And then, wow, I did not remember the stunt they did for this. Uh, Tom gets all the money to make his jump to conclusions, Matt, because he gets T-Bone backing out of his garage after trying to kill himself. And the 96 Ford Taurus must have had incredible crash test ratings if he walked away from... I mean, he did get Wasn't some broken bones. I, I don't remember. I was so startled. It was amazing. Also very dark that, that at least one of the characters tries to kill himself because of his job. Right. So, yeah, very yeah, dark. Very dark. Okay, so we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. This film cost $10 million. It made $10.8 million domestically. So initially it did not get the marketing probably behind it in order to make that up now and or make that up back then. But it's become a cult classic and so it's made a lot more. It made $1.3 internationally, so $12 million altogether worldwide. And adjusted for today, the domestic would have been like 19 and a half million now. So I'd love to know what it's made as of today, because between stream, I mean, I don't know how much money they, of the, the studios make off of streaming now. It's my understanding that it's like a, a, a lump fee. So they say, okay, you can have office space for a year for this much money. Right. So it has to be be making more now almost because it's become a cult classic. And I would think it's one of those movies like I could maybe not now that, you know, it kind of bummed you out. But before we watched it for the podcast, I feel like if you were flipping the channels, it's one that maybe you would stay on. I have watched it in the last five years separate from the podcast viewing. So it gets a 7.6 out of 10 on IMDb. Critics gave it an 80%. Audiences gave it 93. So a big audience favorite. It's an hour and a half long. It's rated R. It's obviously a comedy. The studio, if I didn't say it before, is 20th Century Fox. And Mike Judge won the Star of Texas at the Texas Film Hall of Fame. We watched it on Max. So right now, at least as of this airing, you can watch it for free if you have a subscription to Max. I just want to say one last thing that I was going to talk about when we talked about costumes. Aniston shows up to a party that Peter takes her to. or Joanna shows up in a bucket hat. And nowadays when I see someone in a bucket hat because of my kids, I think of Brad Pitt. And I was like, oh, is this when they were dating? And sure enough, they began dating in 98. He proposed in 99 and they were married in 2000. So I'm wondering if they, if Brad happened to be on set, was wearing his bucket hat and the customer right. said, can I borrow that? So was she eating a burrito in every scene? <laughs> I don't believe it's so. That's where the compare or that's where the connection. You is. mentioned Jennifer Aniston and, and costuming, and I do wonder if the costume department had a great time sourcing all those buttons, or was just irritated at having to find a I thousand think they buttons. Loved it. I think they did. I think they loved it. All right, everybody, that kicks off our um, month. I almost gave away the theme, but I'm going to leave that to you all. Look at our social media for the four films. If you want to be part of our newsletter and on the first of every month, you will get the list of the four films we'll be talking about. Send me an email that's in the show notes and I will put you on our email list and you will be getting those newsletters and you'll get your first crack. One of our listeners, Elizabeth, who won, she guesses almost five minutes after the newsletter comes out. 
Wow, that's a savvy strategic maneuver. I know. Right? Tries to get in early. Yeah. So let me know if you want that, but never forget. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 